Let's talk today about financial modelling best practice and techniques. My name is Danielle Stein Fairhurst. I am a financial modelling specialist and I absolutely love talking about financial modelling. So before we go any further, I'd like to just define perhaps uh, what a financial model what a financial model is. I know that there's lots and lots of different definitions out there. You could define it as saying it's simply a complex spreadsheet, but in my opinion, there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, generally, we say that there's a problem uh, in the real world that requires a solution. And so a financial model is a tool that's usually built in Excel that displays possible solutions to a real world financial problem. And you'll find throughout the course of this session, I'm going to refer quite a bit to the two books that I've written, uh, Financial Modeling in Excel for Dummies and Using Excel for Business and Financial Modeling. Now they cover similar ground, except that the dummies one is written in a more dummies kind of format and I'm going to use, I'm going to refer to uh, some examples from those books throughout the course of this video. Now financial modelling is such an important topic uh, and best practice is a critical part of financial modelling. So I have uh, covered fin uh, best practice in financial modelling in both books so I'm going to uh, be referring to both of those. So Really, the reason that we say that financial modelling best practice is so important is to reduce the possibility of error. So there's probably three different types of errors that can occur in a financial model. Uh, if you are not absolutely terrified of having an error in your financial model, you should be. It's probably the number one thing that a financial modeler is worried about is uh, uh, probably the, the formula error, the first one is, is the easiest kind of mistake to make but it's also the easiest to fix. If you find that a formula error slips through, it's probably quite career damaging. Um, incorrect assumptions or inputs uh, is, is, is also a serious problem but probably less uh, of the onus for that is on the modeler, although the modeler should always check the assumptions, um, it's not really a calculation problem. And lastly, the logic error, um, just the way that the model, that, so the, the way that the model has been calculated, um, that can be, that's probably one of the most difficult type of errors to, uh, to track down and identify. So all of those three different types of errors are uh, something that a good financial modeler should always be constantly uh, on the lookout for. And what I'd like to take you through today are some best practices on how to perhaps try to reduce the possibility for these kind of errors in financial modeling. So the, uh, the topics I'm going to go through today is uh, assumptions documentation, of course, because that's probably one of the best ways of um, or important points of best practice in financial natural modeling. Uh, we'll go into some strategies for reducing error. Uh, some ways to build error checks into your financial modeling and then lastly we'll have a look at some tips, tricks, do's and don'ts for best practice in financial modeling. So the first thing we're going to look at is uh, the why and how of assumptions documentation. So it's very important that you list very very clearly what the assumptions are in your financial model. I mean it's really just garbage in and garbage out. So you you can have the most beautifully built and the most wonderfully laid out financial model but if the assumptions that go into it are garbage then the uh, the results of the financial model will not be very good either. So it's very important that uh, you know what those assumptions are and that if you go to validate a model, you really need to be validating the assumptions and having really good documentation of assumptions will really help with the validation uh, and can avoid misinterpretation of the model as you're, as you're going through it. So it's very important that you should list assumptions on a separate page and really, the more detail, the better uh, in a situation 
like this. Uh, it's always uh, it's it's much better to have it very very granular um, step by step assumptions. You may not need it, but just having it there uh, for later is uh, just a uh, something that as a modeler you'll probably really be really grateful for later on. So uh, let's have a look at the different methods of documenting assumptions now. Uh, I'd like to take you into Excel and we're going to have a look at each of these types of uh, assumptions documentation techniques. So let's jump over to Excel now and we'll have a look at the first sort of documentation and this is in cell comments. So this is using a, a little note. So this is something that's fairly new that came out with Excel 365 and you can do that here if you go to the insert and add a comment. You can also see that there are some threads that are and you can even if you tag people in these notes it'll actually send you an email so um, there's some little uh, uh, some that's, that's a fairly new thing that you may not have seen before so what I just showed you there was a comment but you can also add in a note as well so you can say um, you know whatever you'd like there so that's the old-fashioned way of doing it so it's still there they generally don't take things away in Excel uh, but you can also do uh, that type as well so there's a couple of different options there uh, the next one I wanted to show you was a data validation comment I quite like these because you click away from the cell let me just zoom in a little bit and you can do everything like that and then as soon as you click on the cell you can see that this pops up and so you don't it's quite discreet you don't see it unless you click on it and the way that we do that is go by going into the data validation the input message and you can just type it in there just where you would put the drop down the next one is footnoting so this is just a very simple kind of um, using a this is just I've actually formatted that as a superscript and then just used it like that. You can go into the page layout and you could add some footers in here. I'm not a huge fan of doing that because you can't see it unless you print and generally modeling is very much a soft thing. We're always looking at the soft copy of the file so probably not so keen on doing that. Um, doing just a simple footnote like this is uh, a pretty good way of doing it in my opinion. So the next thing is hyperlinks. So hyperlinks, you can do that by, you can just type something in. I mean, if you have a, a website, you could just put in, you know, the ATO, something like that. So that's just your, your source. Alternatively, you can actually just add a link. You can just go in to insert link and you can just find something let's say you can uh, go to a name or something like that and then when you click on that it's going to jump to part of the model that you wanted it to so that's some hyperlinks that's not a bad idea for uh, documentation in a model uh, you know for footnoting and uh, help making it easy for people to find their way around so the next one is the hard-coded text and I quite like this one where you simply, it's very, very simple, you've just simply typed in, just said note, the growth rate doesn't change over time. So nothing really fancy about that. But if you did want to add uh, some numbers into that uh, commentary, over on the next tab here, what you could do is um, use an ampersand so I've just used some inverted commas an ampersand and then I've just used the text to format it and then linked it to the year as well so that if that number changes you can see that the number automatically changes as well so that's not a bad idea when you're probably more to do with description and commentary uh, because if you're going to describe something in a model the soon as you uh, put in the description the chances are something's going to change and then your description will be out of date. So those were the different uh, ways to document uh, assumptions in a financial model.
So what I'd like to take you through next are some strategies for reducing error. So as I mentioned, uh, it's probably the number one thing that a financial modeler is worried about is having errors in their financial models. So I'd like to take you through 10 different strategies for reducing the errors in a model. So chapter 13 actually of the Dummies book, there's actually a whole chapter and it takes you through on each of these 10 strategies in quite a bit of detail. So I'd like to just go over those with you now. The first strategy is to use the enter key. So uh, when you're building a model, it's a good idea to get into the habit of using the enter key rather than clicking somewhere else. So let me show you what I mean by that. Just coming back over to Excel, we've got a very simple example here. And what I often find is that people use, um, maybe they use the F2 shortcut here to check to make sure that something's picked up okay. And then they happy with that and then they click somewhere else. And that's not a great idea because every now and then, most of the time you'll get away with it. Even worse than that, people move on and they haven't even looked at what the number is because sometimes this can happen where it picks something up and then you end up with an error and then you autocorrect and cause all sorts of problems. So the number one line of defense against errors in financial models is to use the enter key. So try to get into the habit of using the enter key rather than just clicking somewhere else. So the second point here is that you should check your work. Uh, after you've hit that enter key, you should look at the formula. Does it look right? Does the value look correct? Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, do your calculation, hit the enter key and then have another look at it. Does it look like the number that you would expect it to be? And when you've checked it, check it again. Uh, get out your calculator and do a bit of a sense check. Make sure that the values are correct. And when you've checked it three times, have someone else check your work. Uh, have a colleague check it. I used to have a bit of a deal going with one of my colleagues. I'd say, look, you check my models. I'll check your models if you check my models uh, before you send it up. And just to make sure that there's no errors in there. So documentation and validation of assumptions. So we've talked about that garbage in, garbage out. So make sure that it's really, really clear what the, uh, what the assumptions are in your financial model. Uh, when you uh, go to do your documentation, uh, documenting a methodology. So rather than just documenting what those numbers are, you can uh, actually even do a sort of a, a flow chart like this to show the methodology. And this can actually reduce those logic errors that we talked about. The other thing that you could do is some stress testing. Uh, if you put some nonsense numbers into your model, so uh, you know, if you set your price to zero, for example, the revenue should be zero as well. I mean, obviously, you would never have a zero price, but um, that's something that uh, can just test if the actual uh, mechanics of the model are working correctly. Uh, for example, you could double your headcount and you would then expect your staff costs to double or you might change the growth to zero. Uh, so then you would expect everything to be flat or you could take actually not a bad idea to look at things visually. So look at your metrics and chart them over time and then you'd be able to see if there's any abnormalities. So that's another method perhaps that you could use for stress testing. Another strategy for reducing errors is uh, to apply some sensitivities or scenario analysis. So let me give you an example of a, a very simple example, perhaps of what a scenario might look like. So this is an example 
that comes from using Excel for business and financial modeling. And we've just got a very simple uh, building cost per square meter, sale uh, price per square meter. And we're on the base case. So it's picking up the base case numbers. You change it to the best case and all the numbers change. You change it to the worst case and all the numbers change. So this sort of um, scenario analysis can really help to flush out some errors in your financial model. Now the next point is to take note of those Excel errors. Uh, now Excel errors really are your friends. I know they look a bit frustrating when you find a when you open up a model and it's full of these Excel errors. Uh, it's important to note the difference between an Excel error and a, an actual model error because these are, when you see something like this a div zero for example it's not it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong it just means that you're trying to divide by zero and I know that you can use an if error to suppress them but I generally uh, try to leave my errors if possible because they can really show if there's a problem the first one is the railroad tracks I don't mind that one uh, the hash na is uh, not a big deal a name is really when you've perhaps used a named range and it's not recognizing that names. Uh, refs are pretty nasty so ref means that you're referring to a cell that no longer exists. Uh, value, uh, yeah it's not, a, not really a big deal. Uh, the spill error is something that uh, is important to remember. That's, uh, that's going to catch a lot of people out because there's this new dynamic arrays in Excel 365 and that means that there is a new spill error so let me just show you what a spill error looks like so that you'll be able to fix it. So just coming back into Excel, so let's say you've got a list of cars here and ordinarily if you wanted to have a unique list of cars you'd be able to go in and do a remove duplicates and that would work but I'm going to do, I want to leave that list. I want, I want my original data to stay where it is. And I'm going to use one of the U formulas that came out with Excel 365, which is a unique formula. So that's going to give me a unique list. And if I do that, it's going to try to automatically spill down. And you can see that there's uh, a little bit of a, a comment down below. So if you're planning to use these dynamic arrays, just make sure that there's nothing below the formula. It's not a bad idea to get into the habit of not really having anything underneath. So if I were to get rid of this and just maybe move this over to the side for example and you can see there that it's going to just automatically pick up uh, the unique formula and so that spill error basically means that it was trying to spill down to uh, to give me all of the uniques but it couldn't do it because I had something in the way so that's generally the reason why you would get a spill error and circular references are pretty nasty. They mean that you are trying to link to a formula, you're trying to link a formula to itself, which is uh, is pretty horrible. And uh, you, in my opinion, you should not have a financial model with a, a circular reference. I know that some people say that it is okay to have a circular reference in a financial model. And the situation would perhaps look something like this, where you have interest payments that are driving your profit and then the profit drives the funding and then the funding drives the debt and then the debt drives the interest and the interest drives the profit and the profit drives the funding and you end up with a big circular reference in the financial model. Now that's a really common situation uh, to build in a financial model and I know a lot of modelers that will just simply enable iterative calculations. That will work. I f in my experience I find it causes a few problems so generally uh, I would recommend that you should break the loop somehow either mathematically or by using a macro perhaps to, um, to break that, uh, that calculation or sort of somehow get around it uh, by using a workings tab or something like that. So I don't recommend using having circular references so in my opinion that is a, a kind of an error. So the last strategy for reducing error is uh, error, error checks. 
So uh, a good financial modeler is really is always looking for opportunities to include error checks in their financial model. Um, so checks basically will help you, probably won't help you so much when you're building the model, but they will help somebody using the model. And so it's important to remember that an error check should not replace good modeling practice. So you should still use good financial modeling best practice but you should um, add error checks into the model as you're building it so that that will flag if there's a problem or if somebody makes a mistake on the inputs you know put something in that perhaps the model isn't expecting so those are all of the uh, strategies for reducing errors uh, I'd like to go into a little bit more detail now about error checks because I think it's a uh, quite a, an important part of, uh, of, of, of financial models so I'd like to just have take uh, take you through a couple of different uh, options for error checks um, my favorite error check is just simply one cell minus the other. I think uh, that is probably the easiest and the simplest way of building an error check. You could use uh, equals equals and that will give you a true and a false. You could say if one cell does not equal, uh, that can cause a few uh, issues. Um, if I prefer, if you are going to go with that more complex solution, you would perhaps use if the absolute value of one cell minus the other is greater than one, that would then give you a tolerance for error. I'd probably prefer to do that one. Um, you can also do perhaps a summary page. So let's have a couple of uh, look at a couple of examples here. So this one's an example of just saying if one cell minus the other or if the absolute value of one cell minus the other is greater than one so that will allow a tolerance for errors so like for example if somebody were to put automatic and then put automatic space for example that's a really common error then that will flag up that there's an error in there. On the next tab is another example this is probably one of my favorite types of uh, error checks is just simply saying if we take our uh, sales or expenses and split that out over the year you would expect that the total here should be the same as the total here and therefore we've just done a, an error check which is one cell minus the other. Uh, in my opinion that's probably the simplest and the easiest way to build an error check. So this is an example from the dummies book. So here's a really common kind of error. So I've just used a range here and uh, the problem of course is that if somebody were to add some more data down below and you know if you were to add south southeast for example and put some data down below sometimes the data will automatically update but usually not and that causes a bit of a problem and what I find a lot of people do is that they'll they'll do that instead which is really bad practice I don't recommend doing that so the solution for something like that is to use a table so use a structured reference table if you convert it to a table by saying insert table then you can actually use the, uh, the 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 table names and that way you'll be able to add when you add something down below it will just automatically update and um, that way um, that will automatically get included in your model so if I were to say southeast west southeast and you can see that that uh, will automatically get included. Just something else to remember when you're building error checks is that Excel does actually truncate at 14 decimal places so sometimes your cell or your your uh, two different cells that you're trying to calculate might be 0 0.000 out and so that first this first couple of options that I showed you doesn't always work so I do, that's why I do recommend using uh, the uh, tolerant allowing a tolerance for error.
So uh, that was uh, building uh, error checks. The last thing I'd like to cover with you is a couple of tips and tricks and do's and don'ts for financial modelling best practice. And the first one that I think is absolutely critical in financial modelling is consistency of formulas. And this is something that is Excel 101, but you would be amazed how many uh, quite advanced or, or quite experienced Excel users haven't done this before. So let me show you what I mean by this. So in this first example, we are having consistent formulas. So instead of having to go like that, say this cell, multiply by this cell, and then going to this cell, multiply by this cell, having to do uh, nine different cells. What we've done here is used uh, the F4 shortcut or using your dollar signs so that you can, it anchors the column and the row and that way you have one single formula copied all the way across and all the way down. So that's probably uh, the best and the most simplest way of doing it. Uh, if you're using dynamic arrays, it might look something like that. Um, I still think it's a little bit more difficult to follow. If you are using named ranges, you could do it like that. I That is not a great way of doing it because you have to have three different named ranges. So if you did want to use named ranges, you would perhaps have to create a name for the entire heading and the entire um, row heading and the column heading as well uh, for your calculation. Um, in my opinion, I still think that first method is probably the best. So that's my first tip on uh, financial modeling best practice. Uh, the next one is to always link. So that was my first tip on financial modeling best practice. Uh, the next one is to link, not to hard code. Um, always linking as much as you possibly can uh, when you link from one file to another using named ranges is usually a better idea. The reason that we want to link, particularly for in a financial modelling situation, is that you want to be able to trace the source data. Uh, so you want to be able to check and if things are hard coded, then it makes it very difficult to check uh, because the only hard coding should be input variables or assumptions. So a lot of modelers use um, uh, input variables in blue font or they use the, uh, the input styles on the home tab. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here we've used, uh, go to the home tab and you can just use the, I've defined my own uh, styles but you can just use the input style that's given to you there which looks quite nice so being able to uh, link you know means that if your cost of capital for example if that were to change to eight percent you can see there that the calculation automatically changes and everything just flows through beautifully so here's another example from the dummies book as to why we would link so for example if you're doing a cash flow forecast you have your opening cash and that links down to your closing cash which links to your opening which links to your closing so you have this sort of core screw cash flow technique and if you haven't linked then that simply doesn't work. So the next tip that I'd like to take you through is only entering data once and that was like that example where you uh, enter it once and then everything just changes right throughout the model. So you would never 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 type numbers into formulas so let's look at an example here. If you've got a start date here and you've got everything rolling forward, if you're uh, if you want to roll that forward for the following year, you would be able to change that and everything would just flow through. So this idea of having these links right throughout the model and always linking to the source uh, is just such an important uh, technique in financial modeling best practice. So the last point of financial modelling best practice that I'd like to go through with you is the idea of formatting and labelling. So using the symbols make it really easy to read, uh, making sure that you don't um, mix up 
you uh, mixing units, uh, mixing apples and oranges, or in uh, most situations, uh, different currencies, for example, is probably one of the most common errors in financial models. Um, making sure that your data is labeled, uh, label it really clearly, and make sure that you only use one column and one row. And uh, generally, we have a, a column or a row for the unit and for the currency headings, and so it just makes it really clear and makes it really easy as to which type you're actually using. So here's an example. Uh, let's say here if you were to see a table that looked like that, uh, you can see that it just makes it really difficult to follow because uh, the labels are quite badly done. Uh, the percentage, for example, you can see that uh, you can see it's a percentage, so you don't need to have a heading for percentage. The amount, uh, we don't know what sort of units it is. Is it dollars? Is it number of units? Is it kilometers? We, we don't know what on earth it's talking about. Uh, there's really bad formatting on the numbers as well. It just makes it quite difficult to follow. So uh, I know it's quite fiddly, but do pay attention to your formatting and your labeling when you're building financial models. So these are the points that I've covered with you today, the why and how of assumptions documentation, the strategies for reducing errors. Uh, we, we took a look at building error checks into your financial models. And lastly, we took a look at tips and tricks and do's and don'ts for best practice in financial modeling. So if you enjoyed uh, what we just went through, you might like like to take a look at some of the online training courses that we have available at Plum Solutions. Uh, the other thing, if you are considering pursuing a career as a financial modeler, then you might think about uh, sitting the financial modeling certification exam. So that means that you become a certified financial modeler and you do need to sit a physical exam. Uh, it's generally run uh, twice a year uh, most of the time, uh, May and October, and you need to build a full financial model within a four hour uh, time period. So it's quite a challenging exam and it means that the certification is quite well respected. So I hope that you found this short presentation useful. My name is Danielle Stein-Fairhurst and I'd love to see you again.